95% of our life is coming from the programs of how to live life that we get in the first seven years of life. And that's why poor people stay poor and rich people stay rich. The movie The Matrix is not science fiction. It's a documentary. Every human first seven years is hypnosis. The brain of a child under seven is in a lower vibrational frequency. When you put wires on a person's head, you read electroencephalograph, reading brain activity. A child below seven has a lower vibration than consciousness. It's called theta. Theta is imagination. That's how kids play a tea party with mud pies. But to them, it's a real thing. A kid rides a broom, it's a horse. That's theta, imagination. Theta is also hypnosis. And the idea is this. Before you can become conscious, if you don't have any programs, what are you going to be conscious of? So nature makes the first seven years. What kind of programs are required to live on this planet? I say, how do you get them? Theta is hypnosis. You just watch. You watch your parents, you watch your siblings and your community because you have to learn how many hundred thousand rules. Think about it. Just to be a functional member of a family and a functional member of a community, there are rules. Teach an infant these rules. Oh, you don't have to. First seven years, they just observe it and just download it. And then I say, well, why is it relevant? Because this is the unfortunate fact. 95% of our life comes from those programs in the subconscious. Every day, only about 5% of their life are you using conscious, which is creative. 5%. And you don't see it because it's called subconscious, below conscious. And the Jesuits, for 400 years, they were boasting. and People didn't understand. They say, Give me a child until it's seven and I will show you the man. They've been saying that for 400 years because they knew seven years was the program period. And 95% of your life after that will be whatever that program is. A child isn't functioning in consciousness until after seven. Before seven is direct record. Whatever you just said, I just recorded it. So if the parent gets mad at the child and says, you don't deserve that, you don't deserve this, go. The child is not consciously understanding what you mean. Child just recorded, I do not deserve. Now, if I hear that several times, especially in an emotional situation, because that downloads it faster, now I'm 40, 50 years old. What is my behavior 95% of the time? And the answer is, well, it comes from the program. I do not deserve. What does that mean? Unconsciously, I will sabotage myself to make sure that the program is correct. I'm making the program true by adjusting the behavior to meet the program. Look, this is not new. I mean, there's a famous book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And basically said, you come from a poor family and you could struggle your whole life and try to get rich, but you're not going to make it. And if you come from a rich family, you could be stupid your whole life and make it. Not because it was thinking, but it was unconscious behavior that was downloaded from rich families into kids, which is unconscious. So they're making the right moves unconsciously. If they engage their conscious mind, then they look stupid, but it's unconscious. And that's the same thing with poor people. Poor people have beliefs from the family. Oh, you can't make it. Life's a struggle. Things are hard. Who do you think you are? And if that's the program you get, then 95% of the day, you will sabotage yourself. And that's why poor people stay poor and rich people stay rich because the programming. Before I put this knowledge into effect, and I use the word put into effect, why? I had the knowledge academically. It's like, oh my God, look at the research. What does it mean? I understood it from the level. And with all that knowledge, it didn't change my life. People read self-help books. I go, well, you read the book. You got a lot of knowledge. Is your life changed? No, but you got a lot of knowledge. And so here's the difference. The conscious mind is creative and can learn in any number of ways. Read a self-help book, go to a lecture, listen to this, and conscious mind's going to get some awareness. But subconscious mind doesn't learn that way. Subconscious mind learns in two fundamental ways naturally. Hypnosis, which is the first seven years. And after age seven, how do you put new programs in? Repetition. Practice. You want to drive a car? You didn't learn how by just getting in the seat and put the key in. You had to practice driving the car. You want to learn the alphabet. How many times did you go from A to Z? Try to go to A to Z before you can complete it. And once you completed it, you didn't have to go back and do it again. So two phases. You want to train the subconscious mind? Hypnosis. Repetition. I like the last one because there's a new phrase that's bandied about called fake it till you make it. Meaning if you're not a happy person, I say you want to be a happy person, then repeat all the time. I'm happy. I'm happy. Well, you don't look happy or anything. No, who, who am I talking to? By repetition, I'm talking to subconscious. If subconscious gets I am happy and 95% of your life comes from that subconscious, there will be a point once the subconscious got I am happy, you don't have to say it again. It'll be automatic. It's repetitive. That's the secret part. Putting a sticky note on the refrigerator is more like a suggestion, but it's not a repetition. So it doesn't work very well. Repetition is a habit. It's making habit. So you got to do something religiously in the sense of repeating it, repeating it, repeating it to make it work. Every night when you go to bed, 
just when you're falling off into sleep, consciousness is disconnecting. The next period of your brain operation while your consciousness is disconnected is theta, which is the same brain function as in the first seven years. So if you put a pair of earphones on at night with a program of what you would like to be true in your life, as soon as your conscious mind disconnects, that program is playing. It's not playing into your conscious mind. That's shut off. It's now going straight into the subconscious mind. So it's called auto hypnosis. You don't need to go see a hypnotherapist. You just have to pick out what program would you like to have that you don't have. 95% of your life is coming from the subconscious. Your life is a printout of your subconscious behavior. So you don't have to try and think about what happened. I just say, look at your life. The things you like that come into your life come in because you have a program that supports them. But anything you struggle with, work hard at, put a lot of effort into making it happen while you're working so hard, inevitably you have a program that doesn't support that conclusion and you're trying to override the program. So you don't need to do a lot of shrink and psychology stuff. You just look at your life and say, where am I struggling? Because wherever you're struggling, inevitably it's a program in your subconscious that does not support that destination you've been looking for. I had to deal with the issue of teaching medical students and going into the classroom teaching conventional curriculum the old genes control life story and so I go in there and teach that to medical students but when I'd go back in my lab and look at my research on stem cells my research revealed conclusively that the environment in which the cells live determined genetic activity so it's complete opposite of what I was teaching in medical school and the difference is profound the conventional story, almost everybody's programmed with genes turn on and off and then they control the character of your life. And if you buy that story, which I did and which I was teaching, it really means that we're victims, victims of our heredity. We didn't pick the genes as far as we know. You don't like the traits, you can't change the genes and the genes appear to turn on and off by themselves. All of a sudden you see that your life is not under your control, it's under the control of the genes. And a lot of people feel that way looking at their family history and going, oh my goodness, I, I might have the genes for cancer or whatever it is. Since consciousness is involved, once I feed you with an idea that you are susceptible to something, look, I can feed you with an idea that this pill that we just got from the pharmaceutical company, it's the greatest, best thing for your issue. And I give you this pill and you get better. And then later you find out it was a sugar pill and everybody goes, yeah, that's called the placebo effect. And I go, well, what does it really mean? You didn't get healed by the pill, you got healed by the belief in the pill. Well, yeah, that, that's what placebo is all about. And at least one third, minimum of one third of all medical intervention is placebo effect that where the healing comes from. And everybody goes, yeah, I know about the placebo. I go, yeah, but that's a result of positive thinking. What about negative thinking? And this is what we don't talk about, but the reality is it's equally powerful in regard to affecting your biology as is positive thinking, but it works in the opposite direction. A negative thought is called the nocebo effect, it can cause any disease and you can die. If you believe you're gonna die, you can die from the belief. Here's a simple fact. Stress causes up to 90% of doctor visits. How can stress do this? And the answer is very simple. Stress causes a hormone called cortisol to be released in the body. So what does cortisol do? Number one, it causes the blood in the viscera, the guts, where maintenance of the body and healing comes from all the organs. It causes the blood vessels to shut down because it pushes the blood to the arms and legs. Why? Stress means you're ready to run, fight or flight. So you push the energy to where you need it, arms and legs. Well, where do you get it from? Well, you squeeze the blood vessels in the gut. Well, the viscera is growth. That's what the organs are for. Arms and legs are for protection. If I'm in protection, I shut off growth. And more importantly, stress hormones shut off the immune system. The reason is just energy. The idea is if you're being chased by a tiger and you have a bacterial infection, how do you want to split the energy? How much energy do you want to run away and how much do you want to fight with the immune system? The answer is the hell with the bacterium. I mean, if the tiger catches you, the bacteria is useless, it's meaningless, you know? So when you're in stress, stress hormones shut down the immune system to conserve energy. Does the immune system use energy? Of course, if you've ever been really sick, you never even got out of bed, you have no energy. And if you're in fight or flight mode, you need the energy to deal with the world. So stress hormones physically shut off the immune system. When you're under stress, that's when sickness starts to show up. In fact, it's so good at shutting off the immune system, doctors give patients who are gonna receive a foreign organ, a graft of a kidney or a lung or whatever they're grafting, that's foreign tissue. If you put a foreign organ in your body, your immune system's job is to eliminate it. So as they're transplanting an organ, they give the patient stress hormones at the same time. 
because stress hormones will shut off the immune system so the organ won't be rejected right away. That's how effective it is. It's used therapeutically to shut off the immune system. Yeah, but everybody out there in this world right now, with a small exception, is under some level of stress. Every one of those people is dripping stress hormones continuously in their body, and those hormones inhibit the immune system, and the result is illness. And if you stop the growth, you say, yeah, but I'm an adult, I don't need to grow. And I say, yeah, but you have to replace hundreds of billions of cells that you lose every day. So we really have to watch out because, as psychologists will tell us, 70% or more of our thoughts are negative and redundant, replaying the same negative thoughts. I go, if thoughts had nothing to do with it, fine. But thoughts, positive or negative, shape our biology. And all of a sudden, now it's time to wake up because our negative thinking is manifesting a negative life experience. But it's not just me saying this. It was me saying this when I first started doing this work in 1970. And my research was repeatable every day. Stem cells are embryonic cells. So they have no potential until you put them in an environment. And then depending on the culture medium, I can make the cell become a muscle cell, change the culture media, make the same cell become a bone cell, or change it again and make the same cell become a fat cell. Genetically, the cell is the same. It was the environment that I was changing. And I started talking about that long before the new science called epigenetics had come into vogue, which was 1990. So I was like 20 years ahead. And of course, for much of that time, my colleagues looked at me like I was a crazy guy because everybody knew the conventional dogma. And I was coming up with a whole different line of belief about it. And now it's come into mainstream. The only problem is this. When you invest so much money into a belief system, and then a belief system isn't really right, you try to hold on as long as you can because if you spend hundreds of billions of dollars in this belief, you don't want to just go, oh, okay, we'll just change it. So uh, it's a struggle, but the reality is coming forward and the public is just becoming aware of it. And it's a revolution because if you believe genes control your life, you're a victim of your heredity. When I say epigenetic control, it almost sounds the same, but epi means above. So when I say epigenetic control, literally it's control above the genes. And this is what we now recognize that the environment, and very specifically, our perception of the environment, changes our genetic activity. So that means, well, wait, that's not a victim because I can change my environment, I can change my perception, and all of a sudden, if I can do that, then I can control my genes. Well, we're going from victim to mastery, from genetics to epigenetics.